Yeah, so today, Mark is on vacation, so me and Bill will be hosting this. And we have uh, He Chan, who is a principal research scientist in uh, Mobius Lab, which is a startup working on uh, computer vision. And today, he's going to talk about a little bit uh, Triton kernels. Yeah, uh, I'll hand over to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in, uh, we are going to talk about uh, how to write a little bit Triton kernels. So these are like typically uh, Triton kernels to run low bit matrix multiplication. Like for example, like when you have uh, quantized quantized weights. Uh, and uh, so this is a really hot topic. Like everyone is trying to work on this. And uh, so typically people will use CUDA class or something like this because they, they are pretty good at GMMs. Uh, but in this talk, we are going to actually talk about doing this in Triton and making sure they actually run fast because like if you just do it in a naive way, it's you're going to be like super disappointed by the, the performance. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so uh, as an overview, so we are just going to start with an introduction. Like I'm going to talk about a little bit quantization like if people are not familiar with the topic and the challenges and why we started this project of writing lobby Triton kernels. And this project is called Gemlight. It's an open source project. And um, after that, I'm going to talk about uh, writing the actual kernels. And uh, I'm going to talk about like some tricks that I have discovered the past two months uh, working on this. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how to integrate these kernels for actual production because uh, you need to make sure that a couple of things are are checked. Otherwise, you cannot just run them in a like end to end. And after that, I'm gonna just show like really fast, like small practice, practical example. And then I'm gonna talk about future work. Uh, what are the current challenges? And uh, I have a Santa Claus wish list like. I have some wish list features that I would like to get. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna also talk about that. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's get started. Like, um, so as everyone knows, like machine learning models are getting super super big. Um, running them takes a lot of VRAM. Like, if you want to run Llama 270B, you like as FP16, like you need like two A100s, 80 gigabytes. One A100 costs like 25K. So you need like 50, 50K to run like one model, which is like ridiculous. Um, and uh, so we need to find ways to run this cheaper and um, and things are even worse, like for training. So Gaunast, which is like also uh, on the Discord channel, like he talked about quantized, uh, okay. quantized. Are, are you sharing the slide? Uh, oh, OK, no. My bad. My yeah. Bad. yeah, no problem. Yeah, like so things are even worse for training. So Gaunast from the Discord uh, channel, he was talking about this like two two weeks ago. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty tough, uh, like LLMs and VA, v, uh, visual language models also, they take a lot of resources and we need like ways to make them a little bit cheaper. So interquantization. Uh, so th the first thing to mention here is that like in transformer models, like most of the weights, they are in linear layers and almost all the compute is in linear layers and attention models. And uh, basically, quantization is the key to reduce uh, VRAM usage and also make them like faster. And um, basically, if you contrast the linear weights, uh, you get significant reduction in VRAM, but you can also run them much faster when you're memory bound because like you're loading uh, this data. And um, so, for example, like this Llama 270B that requires like two. 80 gigabyte a 100 so you can make it uh, use like 3.5 to 4x less VRAM. You can make it inference up to like 3, 4x 
faster and you can run it like 8x cheaper without losing any accuracy like with with the, with quantization which is like really great um and uh like any mistake got this breakthrough is actually partially because of this quantization because like without quantization people will not be able to run on these models like locally and uh yeah so uh you can also quantize activations so uh, this is typically the use case, like when you, you're compute bound, let's say you're using VLLM, you're serving a lot of users. Uh, you can quantize those activations to make it faster. This is what they do in VLLM. And uh, you can also quantize the KV cache. So if your prompt is extremely long, there's some work to quantize the KV cache. So this slide is just to tell you that trans transformers plus quantization means less VRAN and faster inference. That's basically it. That's the message here. Um, so what is actually quantization? Uh, quantization is just reducing the data bit weight. So like you go from FP16, FP32, you can go to int8, FP8, int4, FP4. Uh, so here's an example, like very simple way of quantizing weight. So you, you go from this FP16 tensor to an int4 tensor, which has values between 0 and 16, um, uh, 0 and 15, sorry. And you can pretty much like quantize like any, any, any vector, any tensor, um, like depending on uh, the situation, if it makes sense to actually quantize it or not. Um, so here, like there are a couple of issues. So the first one is once we quantize because it's uh, it's not a lossless compression like you lose uh, accuracy so we want to maintain high quality outputs after quantization so this is that would be a talk for like quantization methods which is not the, the topic of this talk but the topic of this talk is efficiency so um there are two things in terms of efficiency like when you're quantizing the models you want to, them to be quantized faster this is not the topic here but once the models are quantized we want to run them faster and more efficiently so um to do that like we need to write like some custom kernels to do this and this is what i'm going to talk about later so um like very quickly um just to mention that there are very different ways to quantize uh, models so there's linear quantization versus non-linear quantization so uh, linear quantization is mathematically very simple so the way how you dequantize is just a linear operation uh, but there are more advanced techniques uh, that give better results. So these are called like nonlinear quantization. So let's say it's a method that is using vector quantization, or it's basically using some lookup table or something like this. Uh, we are not going to talk about this nonlinear quantization methods. We are going to focus on linear quantization, which is basically methods like GPTQ, AWQ, HQQ, stuff like this. Uh, they can also be calibrated or uh, calibration free and uh, not very relevant here um and in terms of acti activation quantization like we need something to uh, quantize very fast so we need like dy dynamic quantization because every time like we are quantizing on the fly and typically what people do they just use int8 or fp8 with some channel wise symmetry quantization typically works fine with some tricks um there are some methods that use int4 activations like car carrot, uh, but int4 we cannot talk about it much because it's not int4 int4. Tensor core ops are not supported in Triton, so I'm not going to talk about this. So here the situation is we have like some FP16 int8 or FP8 activations, and we have some quantized weights, and we want to do matrix multiplication with these. So, um, so linear quantization, as I said, this is what we are going to talk about. Uh, so as a, an overview, like very simple, when you quantize uh, with some methods like GPTQ, AWQ, HQQ, uh, you basically get like three parameters, which is the quantized which, weights, which is like WQ here. And you have uh, what is called the zero point and the scanning factor. Uh, and which is Z and S. So basically when you dequantize, it's a linear operation. 
Uh, so it, it's just like WQ minus Z multiplied by S, very simple. And when your Z is equal, equals to zero, you basically have symmetric quantization. So you have, just have the scales. Um, however, like when we quantize the weights, we need to use what is called grouping. Um, so because sometimes uh, if we just choose this channel-wise, channel-wise means that each row of W would have one zero point and one scanning factor. So one scalar, one scalar. But this typically doesn't work very well, like once you go below 8-bit, so like 4-bit, 2-bit, 3-bit, like you need this grouping. And typically grouping just simply means that we are going to reshape the matrix and get like a smaller group so we get like more scatters and more zero more scaling and more zero points so this improves performance because like if you think about it when this uh if you just like use a group size of one you basically use like a scaling a zero point like of the same shape as the weight and that would be uh basically lossless uh, but basically here the message here is that there's this grouping, which is that uh, creates some headaches like in CUDA um, that we would need to deal with in the Triton kernels. Uh, and this grouping is very important. This is basically this group size parameter that you would see if you're using like GPTQ or AWQ or HQQ, there's like this group size. That's what I'm talking about. It's like this uh, parameter that basically assigns one zero point and one scatter for each buffer. And this buffer can be like 32, 64, 128, etc. And when it's equal to the number of input features, that's channel-wise quantization. So it's as simple as that. Um, all right. So once we quantize these weights and we get this WQ and Z and S, um, this WQ is actually um, would be like FP16. Like if you do this calculation, there will be like FP16, but like we want to do int eight quantization, right? So the values will be zero, one, two, three, four, five, until like 15, if it's like four bit, but like the data type is still like FP16. And there's like, if you're using PyTorch, for example, like there's no native data type for like int four, for example, like there's nothing like torch.int4 or torch.uint4. So like, how do we do this? How we, do we go like from this FP16 values to this like int4 matrix with that will actually take less VRAM because the FP16 WQ will not take like this VRAM. So what we do is called bit packing and it's basically a trick to reuse uh, the D tags that are already supported to support D tags that are not supported. So, um, so for example, like four bit, you can store two four bits in one eight eight bit, right? Uh, or what you can do, you can store like um, eight four bit in one thirty two bit. So the way how you do this is super simple. Um, you know, basically, basically, what you do is just some bitwise operations. So you do some shifting and and, and that's it. So here, like I put like a very simple uh, PyTorch code that shows you like how you bit pack and how you unpack. So this is, is a, a lossless compression. It's not even compression. It's just like it's just, just the representation of the um, of the, the values in your in your metrics. But this is extremely important, and this is like used like everywhere until we get a natively supported D type. Then, like we need to use this bit packing uh, logic. So uh, I give like a very simple example, like how you do this, like for like eight bit packing, like to pack two four bits here. Uh, it's just like you shift by four and then you do all four and then like the other uh, the other uh, uh, column, you just do basically like shift by four and then you do or eight and then, and then like you get your bit packed. So it is like very standard. Like if you see like any quantization uh, code, like you will see some kind of uh, bit packing. Um, all right, so uh, at this point right now, so what do we have? Like the original linear layer that we had before, so it had it has weights. Of course, there's the bias, we don't care about the bias right now, but basically you have your input activations, which are X, and you have 
your input weights. So this is like the linear, uh, the original linear layer, right? So now the, the quantized linear layer, it has other parameters. So now we have this WQ, we have this zeros, and we have this scanning factor. And we still have the activations. The activations can be also quantized. I didn't put it here just for simplicity, but basically what we need is an optimized math mill that will do this because like what you can do is just dequantize this and you get estimate of w and just call like torch math mill x w estimate like for example but that will be very slow because like we cannot benefit from the fact that the weights are are quantized and they take less we are right so we need like to fuse this operation of dequantization with the dot product inside the kernel and um, this is what we are going to talk about, like in this, uh, in the next slides. Can so, I uh, um, just, can I just like get like a comprehension check that, um, so like the purpose of getting the zero point and scaling factor is to basically match the group of weights that you're quantizing so that you're minimizing like what you're losing. Like yeah, the, yeah, of the compression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just like some parameters that help us maintain um, yeah, accuracy. Like we want the decontrast weights to be as close as possible as like the original weights. If you do it symmetric uh, without calibration, uh, it's not gonna work. Like you're gonna get like very crappy results. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the zero points are basically just shifting. Uh, you, like, even with symmetric quantization, like, you still need to use, like, a zero point, like, to shift, because, like, you cannot pack with, uh, like, uh, int eight, for example. So you, you basically need to pack with the weights, and you need to add, like, a, a shift, uh, um, like, a, an offset, let's say. And, uh, and then, like, in your kernel, like, you... Like you go from u int eight, let's say for example, because u int eight like they are all positives, and your weights can be negative, right? So you need to add like an offset to map them to something positive, right? And then in your kernel, like you need to shift them, but it's like for for both reasons, like you need this shifting, and you also need um, like you need this offset, but you also use this offset to improve accuracy, right? Uh, it, it typically for eight bits, like you don't need the zero point. Like what? But once you go to four bit and you go to three bit, two bit, you actually need the zero point. Like it's very important to get the zero point for like for lower bits. So this is for linear quantization. If you're doing some other type of quantization which is non-linear, you don't have the zero point. You have something else. Let's say you have a lookup table or something like that. Like that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. And there's also another question while we're stopping here. Uh, Eric asks, is there a reason to pack the two halves together instead of packing neighbors together? Uh, I mean, if you just, this is just a simple example. This is not exactly how we are going to do it because the way how you beat back depends on the kernel that you're writing, actually. So, um, there are many ways to beat back your, your data. What is important is that once, when you're writing your kernel, you need to make sure that the, the reading is very fast because, and the reading will depend on the way how you beat back the data, right? So the way how you beat back it actually depends on the kernel that you're writing. And that would be actually different from like, if you're, let's say we are writing a CUDA GNV kernel, let's say with very, like uh, with predefined values, for example, oh, I'm gonna chunk my data to exactly like 32, uh, as, uh, like a block to of 32, and I'm gonna do this. In this in this case, you can actually beat back it in a way that will make data loading very fast for that specific kernel. Yeah, uh, and, and this is actually something I'm gonna talk about because this is this is actually one of the challenges because we need to write different kernels, but they need to use the same beat packing uh, and um, I'm actually going to get back to to that a bit later. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, so, um, so just a quick reminder about like this concept of memory bound, compute bound. Um, very important concept to understand because um, 
different, we need different kernels for different steps. So let's say you have an input prompt that goes uh, to a model and this is called the preview phase. Like the first step that you're processing your prompt, this is called the preview phase. This is typically compute bound, which means that you have a lot of calculation compute going on and the speed by which you load the data is actually doesn't matter much. This is basically what it means. But once you do this preview phase, then let's say you're decoding one token at a time. Since you're decoding one token at a time, there's not a lot of compute going on, right? So the speed of this step will depend by the speed at which you load the data, not the compute, because like don't have much compute, but you still need to load the same amount of data that you were loading in the prefield phase, right? Because you still need to load all the weights all the time. So uh, this is this is called a memory bound and a scenario, and you actually need different kernels for different situations. So for the compute bound, like you need what is called a GMM, like it's a matrix matrix multiplication. And if you're like compute bound, you need a matrix vector multiplication or a batched, let's say batched uh, matrix vector multiplication. So, and we need to write kernels for each one of these. So, so that's the challenge. So um, again, uh, running this module low bit, which we are trying to do, uh, we need this fused kernel, uh, and this is not available to do like in PyTorch like directly. Uh, you, so you need like an external library that has implemented this fused kernel. So there are a lot of open source uh, uh, solutions here. So there's a, a really fast custom CUDA kernel in in Torchio. It's called TinyGMM. Uh, that's my favorite way of running. 4-bit quantization because it's very fast. But the problem with this kernel is that once you go like above but size eight, it gets very slow because it's a GMV kernel. So that kernel is actually specialized in a decoding. So like the preview would be very slow, but the decoding would be very fast. And also it's uh, it doesn't support two bit, like three bit, like the stuff that I'm interested in, etc. So there's Marlin, which is used in VLLM. It's basically the fastest kernel. It's very difficult to get something a little bit faster than that. Also like 4-bit. And the issue with that is that the, the zeros, they are quantized. And like for some methods like HQQ, like you cannot use it because like you need the weights to be, be FP16. And basically the same story. It doesn't support like 2-bit. It doesn't support 3-bit, uh, et cetera. There are solutions like BitBlast, so Lee. Uh, who actually built BitBlast. He gave a, a very cool presentation last week on, the, on the, the Discord channel. So he was talking about like TVM, like using TVM to generate all these kernels. Um, that's also like really good. It's very fast, uh, but uh, it's actually very difficult to work with. Like if you want to customize the kernels to do something very specific, it's a huge code base. It's relying on TVM to compile all the kernels. So like very difficult. To customize and like the fourth solution is to use Triton, but because like Triton is very easy to customize, but the performance is not very good. So like we have all these issues, and I was sitting like this cat like two months ago, and I was like, you know what? Like maybe we should do all this thing like in uh, in, in Triton uh, because like Triton there are like some good reasons like we why we would use Triton before. Uh, like uh, instead of like CUDA or something else. Yeah. So like why Triton? So the first version of the project was actually CUDA. Um, uh, like I only started like to nibble like more seriously with Triton just two months ago. But before I was doing CUDA and uh, I was doing basically a GMV, uh, which was working like really good. But then I started to try to do some weird GMMs and the performance was very bad because it's actually very difficult to write some high performance uh, high performance CUDA kernel. And uh, then I start to look, oh, maybe we can do it in Triton. But I tried Triton before, but the performance was not very good. So I was like, let me give it a try and see like what's going on. So like the cool thing about Triton is that it's really easy 
uh, to write. Um, and it's very easy to learn. So I will encourage everyone on the, 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 the Discord channel to at least give it a try. It's a really cool skill to have. It's very easy. It would just take you like one or two days to just um, uh, to just like get started. Like there's a really cool lecture from CUDA uh, GPU mode, like from Omar, Omer. Uh, like uh, anyway, you, you'll find it in, in the GitHub page. Um, like really good intro. And so I would encourage everyone who is not familiar with the language to try it on to just like give it a try. So it will make like many things like easier for you. Um, yeah, it's like easy to easy to write and also very easy to debug. It's not like CUDA every time like you want to debug something it needs to compile. So basically like there are some flags you just set and you can actually print the shapes. You can print the, the content of the tensor. So this makes like um, many things like much faster to develop. Uh, so for me as a researcher, like my job is not to write the fastest kernels is to basically test if the idea makes sense or not. And Triton is perfect for that because like you can get like an idea very quickly if your idea sucks or not. Um, so uh, also Triton is well integrated with PyTorch because like Torch compile, they rely also on a Triton. And um, also it supports like different devices. So they are currently working on CPU. It, it should work with AMD GPUs as well, but I haven't tried it myself, but I just know that it's supported. Etc. Uh, yeah, there's a question here. Like, do you recommend to learn CUDA first? I would say yes. Um, yeah, it just like things would make a, a little bit more sense once you learn like CUDA a little bit and then you move to Triton. Um, I would not recommend just learning Triton blindly and not at least have some basic knowledge of CUDA. Like, you don't need to go to Tensor core ops and stuff like that. Just like be able to just understand how threads work and warps, etc. It's just like if you have that that thing, like it would just make your Triton kernels better because some things would make more sense. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so now like we know the problem, so we need to write. So we need to do this much a little bit like very fast. We need to do within Triton. So how do we actually do this? Um, so now we are gonna talk about like writing the kernels. Uh, so as I mentioned before, like we need to write multiple kernels uh, because um, we need like multiple kernels for different situations. Uh, and here again, I get back to this bit packing question that was asked before, like, would it make sense to bit pack it like this or like this? Well. What would make sense doesn't mean that it would make sense for the kernel that you're writing, because like you need to beat back it in a way that is fast to load for that specific kernel. And what might be the best beat packing for some CUDA GMV kernel might not be the best beat packing for a Triton kernel, and that actually creates a lot of headaches because like you can have like this very fast GMV CUDA kernel. But then you have this fast GMM Triton kernel, but they don't use the same bit packing. So like you're using four bit here and four bit here, and then you're like storing double of the weights. So then like you're storing eight bits just to benefit from the speed of each one. So um, basically what we want is to have the same bit packed weight. So we have a single uh, tensor. Like we don't need like to have like different tensors like for each kernel, it wouldn't make much sense. But th this, this is actually a problem because it would impact a little bit performance because as I have explained before, like if, if uh, let's say you, you know your, your um, you, you know which uh, settings work the best for a certain kernel so you can maybe optimize the, the, uh, the bit packing in a way that will make this loading faster, but that doesn't mean that those parameters are actually be good for that other kernel. So basically a lot of headaches in short, we need the same bit packing to work like with all the kernels. And uh, right now, every kernel, like let's say Marlin will be using like a different bit packing, Tiny JMM will be using another bit packing and et cetera. So you cannot just swap them like this, right? So you need like a standardized way of bit packing. Uh, we also need to uh, 
with the same kernel, we need to support different D-types and we also need to support unpacked data and packed data. So for example, if you're trying to do uh, int8, int8, for example, so int8, you don't have to pack it because like there's already torch.int8 D-type. So you just need to cast. But if you're using like four bit quantization, two bit quantization, you need to pack it. But so I'm just mentioning this that like you need to uh, uh, manage this in your kernel. And you also need to manage quantized activations as well. And uh, those also work a little bit differently. Um, so let's start with, uh, before we start, uh, like we start writing the kernels, can, can maybe the questions if I missed something. Yeah, another good question from Eric Schultes. Um, couldn't you repack the weights once the prefill is finished and before you start generating? Maybe you want to go back a slide or two. Oh, actually, I know someone who did this. The problem is that it's very slow to repack, actually. <laughs> it's actually a valid way of doing it. Like, I know uh, uh, someone uh, who had the, the exact same issue. So he was using this tiny GMM, which is very fast for... Uh, very fast for the decoding phase, but the prefill, he was using another kernel, which is very fast for the prefill. They are not using the bit packing. So he tried to repack, but the problem is that the packing was actually, repacking was actually slow. So, um, I mean, if you can make the repacking faster, you it just allows you to use different kernels. But the problem is that you need to know also how the weights are bit packed. Because sometimes you just get like the kernel and, oh, the kernel just does like the fused math mule, but you don't actually don't know how the bit packing was done. And you need to understand how the bit packing was done to actually write the function to repack, right? For Triton, this is not a problem because you can read the code, but um, if you're like given a CUDA kernel, which is like super complicated and you're not like keen on reading like some super, difficult uh, could a kernel, like you're going to get lost like very quickly. But in short, you could if you could make the repacking very fast. But that doesn't solve the, the other issues. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so let's let's write a very, very simple Triton kernel. So the first thing that uh, we need to understand is the data format. So basically, we have two matrices A and B. And basically, what we want to do, so this is Unquantized. This this is FP16, FP16. This is just to get started. Like there's no quantization here. So you have matrix A mat mu with B equals C. Very simple. So M K, so M would be your pad size. K would be the number of channels, let's say. And then your so there's this arrow here. So this arrow here is not random. So this arrow means that it's row, uh, it's row major, which means that it's stored in memory like like this, right? So this is actually very very important because like this single detail will make your kernel like ten times slower if you don't if you don't pay attention to this step. Like like if you, even if you have the best written kernel and you feed it like uh, data in the wrong uh, like uh, row measure or column measure, you're going to get like very bad performance. So this is very important to understand. So there are different ways to do matrix multiplication. So typically what we do is row measure multiplied by column measure. So which means that the input is row measure, which is like the default in PyTorch. Like any tester that you initialize in PyTorch will be row measure. But here, in this case, we want column measure weights. So how do you get column measure weights? You don't just transpose it. You need to transpose it and also make it contiguous. Because if you just transpose it, like you're not contiguous on the rows. Like, so you need to transpose it and make it contiguous. So this is actually very important. So it's like this dot contiguous can make your whole kernel like useless. Just to, uh, like, I spent, like, some hours on this, like, getting crazy. And, like, dot t dot contiguous, very important. So, like, when you do that, then your matrix B will be column measure. So, like, it's going like this, right? So, what we want to do is basically get some blocks. 
So each block from A will be, we will do the dot product with the other block in, in B and we get, let's say, another block in C. Very simple. And basically, Triton it will just help us parallelize this step, right? So we are going to launch different called programs. And basically, we tell the programs how to parallelize this. So when, when, when you're writing a code kernel, you just like make it, um, you just basically work with the blocks and you just say, okay, this block is going to be multiplied by this block and it's going to be stored as this block. This is how Triton works. So um, basically we need to load this PID program, uh, which gives us like the index of the, the block. So then like we need to choose like how to uh, uh, go through the, 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 the blocks. So can either go like linear tile, which means like it's the, just reading like this, or you can do what is called the swizzle. And the swizzle is basically a technique to traverse the, the weights like this. So instead of doing like this, you just do like this. And this basically helps L2 cache usage and other things. I'm not going to talk about it, but just you need to just uh, keep in mind that you can either like go like, like linear tile or you can do swizzle. For some kernels, it doesn't make to swizzle. So for some kernels, it makes sense to swizzle. But at the end, it doesn't really matter. This is just a detail. So the swizzle or tile just gives us the PIDs of the the programs that will run this parallel computation. Uh, what swizzle pattern? I, it's not very important here. Like uh, this is just a detail. But um, basically, you can just use the default one, like from PyTorch, like this, like TL dot swizzle two D. Um, yeah. Honestly, it doesn't make a huge, huge difference. Like in Triton, at least, it it's 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 really like some. Maybe you get like a few tokens up, like a few tokens more, but not not a big deal. Um, just try both, and if that works better, like that's what you would choose. Anyway, so like, so we need to get these pointers like with this offset, etc. And it's very simple. Basically, what we want to do is to iterate through the k dimension and do the dot like load the weights as blocks do the dot product, accumulate, and save, right? Basic GMM uh, algorithm, um, very, very simple. Uh, so now what we are going to see is how to turn this into a kernel which is compatible with quantized weights. OK, here we go. So now, what is the difference between this and this? So now here, your weights are packed, right? So they are, don't have the same shape as B because they are packed with bit packing. And on top of that, like you have the scaling and zeros that you also need to load, right? But the logic is basically the same. So we are also going to like initialize this uh, accumulator with zeros, and we are going to loop through the K dimension, going to load a blocks of A, load blocks of B, but we also need to load the scales and zeros, right? So we, we load those and we need to unpack the weights because like the weights are packed. So we need to unpack them. And once we unpack them, we need to dequantize. So again, this talk is about linear quantization. So minus Z and S and multiplied by S. And then you just do your dot product and then you need to advance your pointer and then you start like pretty simple. So here this E is the elements per sample. So that means that how many elements are packed per, uh, per sample. So let's say you're using 8 bit, that would be equal to 2 if you're using 4 bit. So because like 2, ele two 4 bit elements are packed in 1 8 bit, right? So we use 32 bit. So that would be like 32 bit divided by 4 would be 8, like for the case of 4 bits, right? Um, yeah, and on top of that, like we need to initialize this 
the pointers for the scares and zeros. And we also need to initialize these shifts like that tell us like how to unpack the data. Um, yeah, it's, it's like pretty straightforward uh, change. Uh, hey, I have two questions to you. Um, yeah. Initially, uh, when we when you spoke about the packing and unpacking, I was always thinking of like, how are you going to handle the overflow issues that might actually come in? Uh, but now I realize that your computation is happening on an unpacked data and not on the uh, packed data. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. you have to unpack. Yeah. Right. There's no so, overflow. Yeah. There's no overflow, right? So, yeah. Uh, because like, the unpacked data is exactly equal to the original yeah. Yeah. input. Yeah. Uh, but there is a um, there's a challenge here. Uh, the fundamental challenge here is that um, in the newer, latest generation of the hardware, uh, uh, we have the asynchronous load store operations now. Uh, you can't do uh, some of these operations because you can directly load to the tensor code, uh, right? So then uh, some of the tricks that are being presented here becomes very tricky. Uh, yeah, have you thought about you how, how do you handle that? Yeah, and you can also on the newer like H one hundred, you can just you cannot use TMA to load the weights in a very specific way. Yeah, these are like challenges that I'm gonna talk about later. But, uh, okay. but I, I mean, I mean, you're right. But this, this, this is as I said, this is simple. Like in the, yeah. as the title says, it's just for educational purposes. But um, of course, like there are other challenges, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna talk. Maybe a, like last slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this because I'm aware okay. like, like for example, just to give you like a very fast sneak peek, like to load these weights in Triton, like you need to use like repeated indices and they are mm -hmm. inter interleaved because the problem is that um, the weights are, are packed. So there are two ways to do it. You either load the packed weights exactly how they are and then you need to concatenate them. Because at the end, like you need a block of the same size as, like you need the block size k by block size n, right? But the packed data is block size k divided by, let's say eight, right? And by by n. So like, at the end, so what you can do is just load that, and then you do mm -hmm. some TL interleave, TL interleave, TL interleave like three times or four times. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Or you can just do TL join so you can concatenate them like three times. That are actually much slower because of this concatenation step. How other otherwise what you can do, which is basically the current way of how I do it, is you can use interleaved indices of the same shape. So instead of having like zero, one, two, three, four, five, like the offsets like to load the weights, you can mm -hmm. try it on to load the weights in Zero 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 one 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 two 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 three 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 three. I see. So this way you can actually get exactly block size k block size uh, n, which is great. But you cannot do this with block pointers, and you can do it with TMA. So, mm. so yeah. So that's 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 one of the challenges. But uh, let's talk about this uh, later. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it later. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, I'm aware of. Of, of those uh, those tricks, um, those challenges like with the H one hundred specifically. All right, yeah, uh, let, let's move on. So um, scales like we need to handle two situations. So they are, the the situations are like the grouped scales and zeros. So when you have this grouping, you actually need to load these zeros and scales like inside this loop. You see this four K. So you actually need to load them inside the loop, which is actually kind of a problem in terms of performance. So you actually just wish that Triton will cache them and understand that you don't need to load them like that often. But when they are channel wise, you don't need to load them inside the loop. You can load them after because it's a post scaling operation, right? And that's actually much more efficient. And if you can do this in code, that will actually have a big impact on the speed because like you just tell the Triton program, oh yeah, actually you don't need to load them inside the loop. You don't need to do that. You just load them like at the end of the loop. So you need to handle both situations. You also need to handle uh, the, the, the if your activations are quantized, let's say FP8 or int8, and they use channel-wise scales, you also need to manage how they are 
combined with the scales of the weights if the weights are symmetric, right? The way how you do this is with an outer product. So you do the outer product between like the scales of the activations with the scales of the weights. Or if you don't have scales, like channel-wise scales on the weights, you can just do like one, 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 and you still do the outer product. And that outer product is actually very, very fast to do. So uh, not like really a big deal, but it's just like, I'm just saying this, that like in your kernel, you need to write this. It's not like it happens magically. Um, uh, the other stuff is that uh, we should not contest the zeros because there are like many kernels, like in VLLM, for example, uh, they contest the zeros. That's actually a problem because like some methods like HQQ, like they, they need to contest the zeros and we actually need uncontested zeros for two bit and three bit. The, the other the other thing is that one trick that you can do that you think that will work faster, but it doesn't, is that you can pack the scales and zeros in one 32-bit tensor. Because the idea is that you will have less, less instructions to load the weights, right? So you can just pack them. Like 16-bit, 16 16-bit, 16 you just put them in one 32-bit, uh, like with the same shape. The problem is that you will spend more time unpacking those weights because like there's a cost to unpack the weights and allocate new small tensors that that actually impacts performance at the end so it's actually better to just leave them this is just in terms of end-to-end -end performance measured maybe like in a custom CUDA kernel it would make more sense but like specifically for Triton it doesn't make much more much much sense and uh, also like we need to manage like different situations uh, sometimes uh, like we need to measure, manage like symmetric quantization, which doesn't have zeros, or we can manage uh, situations where we just have a shift without scales. Let's say FP8. Let's say you're doing FP8 by FP8 and your model was actually trained with FP8. So you don't have any scaling and anything. Uh, so you, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need that. But if you're doing, let's say FP8, int 8, let's say, and your int 8 is actually using, let's say, a shift, for example, uh, because you packed it in a certain format. So you just have the zeros in this case. Uh, I mean, these are like edge cases, but I'm just saying like in general, like when you're writing the kernel, like you need to think about this, uh, all these possibilities. Um, so in terms of dequantization op, uh, so uh, again, like you need to, uh, support unpacked weights, which is just a casting. You need to uh, support um, uh, packed weights, which need unpacked uh, unpacking step. And now I get back to uh, Vikram's point that in some on some devices, like this is actually an issue. And um, like, especially like the issue is actually should not exist in the A100 but it does for some reason, very strange. But like the problem is not like 3090, same generation, that no problem, A100, there's a small problem. I mean, it's not like, it depends on the situations, but like it is slower. Like for example, like if you, if you do this trick and you do it like on a 4090 or 3090 or, or like some other GPU, you would expect like for a uh, bad size of one, you would expect the loading to be like 3.5 faster for four bit. But like if you do the same trick on an F100, it's actually less than that. But um, this is like actually an open problem because this is actually not supposed to happen on the A100. It's not. So there is an open issue here on a, on a GitHub page for the Triton Bank. Uh, so we need to investigate like why why this weird issue happens. Um, so I will get back to this issue at the end. Uh, so after a casting and packing, we need to dequantize. So this is like very quite straightforward like this. So so we were talking about the GMM, which is actually good for uh, the prefit phase. Now we need to another algorithm when we have a bad size of one. So this is a GMV. Kernel. So this is when we are. Uh, this is when we are like uh, memory bound, and 
we don't need to do, basically the idea is that we don't loop over the, the K dimension and we just launch more programs to calculate partial dot products. So this is why there's like this dashed, gray dashed um, line here. This means that we are actually going to, it's not like, like basically each, each like small chunk is going to actually calculate just a partial product. So we calculate partial product, partial product, partial product, partial product, and then we are going to sum them. So how do you sum them is with atomic addition. And so instead of doing, doing TL store, you just do TL atomic add. And when you do atomic addition, you need to make sure that the, the output is initialized with zeros because normally we just initialize with empty because we are just going to store the, the output. But like here, it's very important to, to initialize with zeros. Otherwise your result would be incorrect because like you need to add this stuff together. So, but it's also very simple. Here, the big difference is that we don't have the loop, but we also, we don't have TL dot. So we are actually not using tensor cores here. So to use tensor cores, you need to use it on 2D blocks. And here we basically have just a vector. So there's absolutely no need to pad with zeros and to TL dot, like it's just like wasting time. So instead, you, and we also don't need it because we are memory bound. So we don't need faster compute. We just need to load the weights as fast as possible. And uh, so basically what we do is just like summage, like you just do a simple dot product with TL sum and you just like sum over the dimensions as simple as that. Um, are these integer or floating points atomic? Yeah, it's floating point, of course, because like we, when we dequantize, you get floating. Uh, it's always float. However, like if it's int eight, int eight, then in my implementation, I still use floating point atomic addition because uh, there are some limitations with TL atomic add. For example, it doesn't work with B, B float 16. It only works with float 16 or float 32. But uh, yeah, for the GNV, it's floating point. For the, for the GMM split K, I think it's integer. I, I don't remember exactly, but it depends on which output D-type you specify, actually, you can specify which one you, you want. But but yeah, specifically for the GMV, it should be floating point. Um, so uh, yeah, so GMV, again, um, there's no loop. You don't need tensor cores. So now we need to do something else. So just a reminder, GMM is for like, large bat size. So this is for the pre-field. GMV is when for decoding and you have only one, one or two up to eight, like for example, depending on how the GMV is implemented. Uh, but we need something like in between, like bat size between, let's say two up to 32. And for that, like we need another algorithm, which is called the GMM split K and GMM split K is basically a hybrid between the GMV and GMM. Um, so basically the idea is that we are going to take the GMM that we wrote, but instead of having like one single loop of K, we are actually going to split that K loop over more threads. So let's say we are going to split it over like four. And so instead of having block size K, here we are going to have block size K multiplied by split K, which is a parameter that you can specify. So when split K equals to one, then you get a GMM. So, so basically it's like a high, it's a, like a, a meta version of a GMM. Um, and so when split K is more than one, you need this atomic addition as well. So it's basically the same idea. You calculate partial dot products, but here we need tensor cores uh, because you are going to do TL dot. And we get these blocks, let's say four blocks, and we need to do atomic add of these four blocks. That's basically how it works. And this small change can have a huge impact on performance. So split case 
currently the best algorithm to do batch decoding. Uh, it's used uh, in implemented in Catalyst, etc., and it's not too difficult to adapt your GMM to do a split K uh, version. Anyway, so we talked about all these kernels, right? Uh, we talked about GMM, GMV, and split K. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you just put this in your code, it's going to run fast. So you need a lot of tricks to make this fast because if you just like run this and you're going to be very disappointed. So I'm going to share with you like a bunch of tricks I have discovered to make this stuff like run very fast. So there are a lot of tricks. I didn't put all of them, but some of them are super weird, but you need to be aware of. So the first one is that um, the loading order is actually can have a huge impact on performance. So like if you load the weights first, and then you load the activations after, it's not the same performance as if you do the opposite. You load the activation first and you load the weights after. So you would think that Triton compiler would take care of this, but it doesn't. So this can actually have a big impact on performance and it's not something standard because it depends on the kernel and it also depends on the GPU. Like on some GPUs, like this order would work better than some other GPUs. And uh, I haven't seen this thing like anywhere. I, it's just like, I just randomly started to play around with the order and I just discovered this, which is like super strange. So what I, my, my preferred way of doing this because I don't know the order beforehand, I just make it as a tunable parameter. And basically I do, in your auto tune, you just put this parameter like zero, one, let's say, and if it's zero, you just load it first. And if it's one, you just do it after. So it's very strange, but it's actually, it actually works. Like when I say works, it means two X faster. That's, that's the things I'm talking about. So um, the other thing that is very important is eviction policy, uh, because in Triton, um, you don't have much control on which things go to the shared memory, which things are cached, et cetera. The only um, tool that you have is eviction policy and you don't have, so these are available in PTX, but in Triton, like you don't have access to all the options. So basically the most useful, the default one is there's no eviction policy, but there are two very useful ones, which is evict last and evict first. So uh, this is very important for like, low batch size, for example, the split K or the GMV, because basically what we want is that we want to cache the activations. So basically we tell it effect last means that this is the last thing we want to delete. We want to cache this as much as possible, because if you think about it, let's say you're writing a CUDA kernel for a GMV, you can basically just copy the whole activations in your shared memory, right? And then you just cache the whole thing because like, it's not much data, right? And um, the idea is basically the same. It's just like an indicator that you, you tell, tell Triton this thing, I want it to be cached because I know that it's relatively small and I know that caching this, like in this situation will actually give me better performance. This is actually very important because it, it makes like the GMV and split care one quite faster. And, yeah, another very strange thing in Triton is that the loops are super weird. And um, if you take a look at any Py uh, Triton kernel, you just see that they use, okay, 4K in range, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes that is actually crashing in some situations. I have no idea why. There's like a still open issue in Triton for that. And one trick that I found that fixes this issue is to replace 4K with 4K in TL range. And strangely enough, this also makes the kernel run faster. Like why, I, I have no idea. So like there are also a quick, uh, many- <clears throat> A quick question about like the loading order. So do you have like a theory on why that might be? Is it that like, activations are getting cached or something? Or... So, so, yeah, I mean, what made the 
explanation that I had in mind that would make sense is that the loading is asynchronous and basically pinging the weights to be loaded first in activations. You ping them first because they are larger and then you get like a little bit like faster loading, but it's not, it's not, it's not that because like on some other GPU, the other order works better. So I have no idea actually. It's, it's very, I mean, we need to like really investigate like the generated code to, to see what's going on. But, but uh, like one thing to, to do to not think about it, it's just you put it in auto tune, it would figure out like what is the, the best loading order, right? Yeah. So uh, some other trick is that like um, in the, in, especially for split K in the grouping, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the auto tuning parameters, they are actually compatible with the shapes because let's say your, your K, it needs to be divisible by the block size K, right? Because like the programs need to calculate this in parallel, we we'll break this into blocks of some certain shape. So you need to make sure that your K dimension is divisible by the block size. But you also need to make sure that the group size is compatible with the block size, right? So we need to, we need to, the, the block size to be also larger than the group size. Because like, let's say in your kernel, like block size K, that works the best for, for a channel wise is 128 right and you think oh this is the best one and then you use a group size of 64 and then you start to get garbage results right because then basically what you need to do is to check if that block size k is compatible with that group size because here in this situation we want to prune this and say okay this is not compatible with this group size so the, the actual closest block size k to this group size is 64 right? 64 or 32. But you need to take care of this. And the way how you take care of this is by early pruning. So there is like in Triton, you can, you can define how to prune this auto configs and you just say, oh, I'm going to check the group size. I'm going to check, for, for example, for split K, you also need the K to be divisible by block size K multiplied by split K. So some split K, um, values will not be compatible with your uh, auto-tuning parameters. So you just get garbage results. It's not going to crash, but <laughs> you need to make sure that uh, the auto-tuning parameters are valid. So you need to check all the shapes and make sure that everything is, is, is correct. Um, so uh, one thing, another trick is this, the default parameters in many Triton calls are are actually very bad. So like the atomic addition default settings are actually much slower than if you change change it, for example, to relaxed or release. Um, Ray shape is also before it was can order true, which was extremely slow, which was by default, but now they changed it to false. So make sure that your parameters to any call, just read documentation, try different combinations and see which one is faster because the default parameters are not always the, the, the best ones. So you need, to, this uh, is actually I would put very a important. caution here. Uh, I would put a caution here. Atomic, uh, if you're gonna use uh, the relaxed release, acquired release, they uh, primarily define what is the memory consistency model that you are supposed to be working with. Uh, just changing default parameter to something else may not actually be, give you the correctness guarantee. So it's important to know uh, like the data that you're working with and use the right memory, semant memory consistency semantic for it. Yeah, but uh, you just basically change it. You see which one is faster. You, you run your tests with different shapes. Everything is passing, then it's the right one. But um, it's actually what I noticed in general not just specifically to atomic addition, is that the default parameters are not basically the same. And I see that in many kernels, they just use like the default. They don't think about like, what are the other arguments that I can play with to make the kernel faster? But these arguments actually can make the kernels much, much faster. 
I mean, it, this is this is not a Triton problem really because it's impossible to know from the uh, uh, language developer side or even the compiler side. Okay, what is the type of a data that it is going to be used? So you can't. Yeah, solve but that's it. specific to TL Atomic. I'm talking yeah. in general, not not atomic, even the reshape too, right? Um, yeah, but because reshape can change the correctness of the uh, final data, like uh, yeah. the floating point accuracy and all is a problem, right? So. Yeah. Some both of this is a very tricky situation to be because we do not know uh, from the design side. Okay, uh, which one to pick? Yeah, but it's very simple to to check. You just like change it and run and yeah. see if it works. That's yeah. this is basically yeah. But uh, this is basically what I want to communicate. It's just don't get stuck with just like the default parameters. You need to be a little bit uh, go to the documentation, see which other options you can use, and you use them if they work then then they work but um all this stuff um like eviction policy is also always like turned off uh but like changing the eviction policy doesn't make the, the results change but in some kernels like if you put eviction policy first then it's much faster but like this kind of stuff basically um uh, also another thing like um, like when you're using these kernels that that use uh, atomic addition, so you need to initialize the output with zeros, right? So um, if you just do torch dot zeros, it's actually much slower. Uh, so the trick is you do it with TL empty, the same, but then you do a prehook in Python that, that in Triton that basically initialize with zeros. So this is this actually can make the kernel much faster. Um, okay, so. Let me just show you like what all these tricks, what is the different, like what impact does it give like on a kernel? So if you just take like auto GPTQ Triton kernel, which is a GNN, and we just add this, all this bunch of tricks and they check the correctness, you can have actually a huge impact like on, 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 uh, on performance. Actually, this is not using max auto tune. They are both using auto tune, uh, but the, the performance actually should go a little bit higher because it's not just using the max auto tune. Uh, but this is just to communicate that like these tricks are actually very important. It's not like it's not like uh, oh you just write your TL dot load and you just expect it to be fast. You need to play with this stuff and play with this order weird order problem etc. So you can actually have a huge uh, performance. Uh, uh, Difference here. Uh, another pro uh, another difference is another algorithm. So this is GMV split K. So this is from the paper. It's from Meta and IBM. So I just took their split K, like kind of, and I just added this bunch of tricks, and you can see that like the performance is almost double. Um, yeah. So like the. the like this is this is actually a substantial uh, difference. Um, yeah. So uh, let me show you like the some benchmark numbers on uh, on the, the all these kernels with these tricks. So which are part of this gem like project, which is open source. Anyone can go there, check the kernels, see what's going on. So um, so one thing I forgot to mention is that. We have different kernels, and we need uh, some logic to say, OK, if bat size is this size, we choose this kernel. If bat size is this size, we choose this kernel. If bat size is like larger than 32, you need to use the GMN. So here, like we report like, like this. It's basically the best, the best. So this is not one single kernel. This is multiple kernels. And um, so basically what we want, so this is int 8 uh, weights. Uh, Channel-wise, on the fourteen ninety, and basically what we want is something like we want like we want to see like very high speed up, like up to bat size thirty two, and then it needs to go down. And ideally, we want to be close to one. Basically, that's like the ideal kernel. Um, and this is basically what we get. So here, uh, I also have uh, FP eight, and I also have. A uh, int eight. So A eight W eight is int eight activations. FP eight is FP eight activations. And 
A16W8 is basically A6, like 16 bit activation. So this is basically what we want. So something like very high here and then it goes down. This is a four bit example. So here I'm comparing with the, uh, like the Torch AO kernel, which is a GMV, the bit plus, and uh, with the Marlin. So here actually, for this specific shape, the Triton kernel is actually faster than Marlin, which is something completely unexpected. Uh, because Marlin is like for this specific shape, like you can go to more results and you can shape like the other shapes extra. But this is just to see that like if you actually write a, a Triton kernel like here and you use some tricks, you can actually make it like super fast. Um, here, like we have the two bit, uh, bit plus is the only option to use two bits. I'm comparing with two bit plus. Uh, I have also some results with four bit weights, FP, FP8 activations. And I also have A16W4 symmetrics because symmetric would be, as I have explained before, when you have symmetric quantization, you don't, you don't load this, the scales and zeros inside the loop. So you need to just load it after the loop. And that actually makes the kernel faster. So you can see like the difference between this channel wise and the grouped one. There's a, this is how it's supposed to work. So it's like you get faster because like you load the scales and zeros less often. Um, like few words, like how, like, like two bit, four bit, eight bit, one bit is actually very simple because the bit width is a power of two. It makes everything very, very simple. Now the problem, how do you do like a three bit kernel or how do you do a five bit kernel, right? Because then like you will run into like many issues and one solution that you can do is to split this three bit kernel into two bit and one bit. So you'll have two matrices. So you use some bitwise ops to do this separation. And basically what you need to do is to load both of them. So, and then I cast it you int eight because I don't need int 32 here. So basically this is what you do. You load both and then you go here and then you combine them when you're unpacking. And then like you need to keep track of the two weights. So now you're loading two weights instead of one and the scales and the zeros. And then you need to advance the both pointers. So this is the way how I found it and works fine. There are, if you want to do it in CUDA, the three bit, uh, it's possible. It's just like a pain in the neck to do it, but I can try it on, it's just a few lines, etc. So here's a comparison here. So basically what we want is that we want the three bit to be faster than four bit and to be, and the five bit to be slower than the four bit, right? Especially in the prefill phase. So, uh, especially in the decoding phase, sorry when you're memory bound. So this is exactly what we get. And then we want both of them to converge into one X speed up compared to FP16. And this is exactly what happened. So it turns out like that loading two weights is actually not a big of an issue in terms of performance, as far as I, as I could see. I didn't test it a lot because this is still experimental, but this looks looks fine. If you lose some, a few tokens, this is completely okay. Like if the, but it looks, it looks uh, quite fine. <clears throat> so now we are going to talk about integration because now let's say you have these kernels, but how do you actually make them work with the PyTorch model? Uh, you, it's not like you just write them and it is just work out of the box. Of course it doesn't. So you need to, uh, make sure that few things, few things are uh, are working fine. So the first thing is touch compile. So touch compile uh, can actually break with many kernels. Um, so for multiple reasons. So maybe maybe you're using an unsupported feature like prehooks and early config pruning, which we really need. They are actually not supported supported in PyTorch. So basically, if you just do it, if you just try to compile these kernels, it's not going to work. And many 
packages they really rely uh, on on touch compile like to get like because the triton kernels they have a big overhead to launch so if you just run it without touch compile you're like you're gonna be a little bit disappointed so you need this touch compile so basically what you do is that if your Triton kernel is working fine, but it's breaking with touch compile, so you just wrap it in a custom op. And you basically just do register custom op, blah, 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 blah. And you give it like the input D types, and then you define this fake, uh, fake tensor, which basically just returns like empty tensor with the right shape. And it should work fine. The problem is that if you do it this way, then touch compile will not be able to fuse the kernels because now the Triton kernel is fused inside the custom op and it doesn't know that it's a Triton kernel, right? So you're gonna lose some performance because of this, because like touch compile cannot actually fuse these kernels if they are wrapped inside the custom op. But this is basically the trick I found to make any touch compile work with uh, any uh, any Triton kernel work with touch compile, even if you're using some unsupported uh, features from Triton. Uh, the other thing uh, is CUDA graphs, um, very important. So basically, you need to make sure that when you're writing your uh, your function that calls the kernel, you don't use anything that uh, transfers to the CPU. So stuff like dot item, for example, like you should not use because like then you cannot use CUDA graphs. Um, the other thing is that I, I noticed is that when you try to co uh, touch compile a whole model that is using custom ops for Triton kernels, it's not able to use CUDA graphs efficiently. So the way how I the, the way that I found is that sometimes doing CUDA graphs yourself can actually run faster than touch compile. So for example, I was playing with the example on the H100, and I got like from 250 five tokens per second, I got like 300 tokens per second, just instead of doing touch compile reduce overhead, I was just doing touch compile max auto tune. And I was just doing CUDA graphs myself, which is like literally takes like three lines of code. So sometimes you, if you just do CUDA graphs yourself, if you know exactly where to do it, like sometimes it's faster. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, you also like need to some logic that basically selects like the best kernel based on shapes. You need to be able to cache that result because you don't want to run that that thing many times. So if you let's say you run it on one machine like A100, let's say or whatever, and then you're just running a bunch of shapes like you want to run Llama three, Llama two, basically get the, all these shapes and you just run it once you cache that. So you don't have to know which kernel works for each shape every time you run the model. So I, I, in, in the project, I made sure that the, the, the dictionary where I cache this is seriesable because if you just put Triton configs in there, like you cannot save it because Triton configs are not seriesable. So I just needed to switch to something like just strings, for example, to, so you can actually just save it. Um, uh anything else oh yeah so uh auto tune in triton takes a lot of time so there are some um there are some tools like uh, from ibm there's this triton deja vu which basically helps you cache and save this auto tune results uh i haven't tried it myself i know someone who tried it and he got into some issues um i think you can do it yourself with some tricks, but I think this is a feature that is really needed. And I think the Triton team should implement this because it just doesn't make sense to compile every time for the same shape. It's like literally makes zero sense to do it. And it's something that everyone is complaining about auto tuning time. So I think it's time to, it's time to uh, just basically uh, take a look at this and have an official, uh, uh, official support for this. All right. Um, okay, so now let's talk actually end-to-end -end performance because like I was reporting like MatMule uh, performance, like we, we need to see exactly um, like end-to-end, -end, like how it works with models. So this is work in progress. This is not the best 
performance, especially on A100, H100, there's still some work to do. But this is just to give you an idea of what is possible right now. Um, so this is exactly from the master branch. So you just just do git clone master branch and 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 you just choose this kernels. This is the performance you would get. And um, so basically, uh, we want uh, in the preview phase it's working quite good, um, except for the A100, which is like as I have mentioned before, there's this TL load problem in the A100. So. 14 ITLs are actually out for freedom in A100 by a large margin in this case for the pre-fill. Uh, but one thing I need to see, uh, say here is that the, the auto-tune that I used for the A100 is not exhaustive uh, because this auto-tune, I actually did it on the 4090 and I didn't have time to run. And I generated these numbers like before. And after that, I realized, oh, I should have added this freaking a load thing this a load order in the a100 the, the a load zero works better than the one and i actually i was like i just like realized this today i was like shoot i i, I need i need to do the auto tuning with the a with zero load order because for an a100 for some reason like loading the activations first then the weights works better don't ask me why it's a uh, i have no idea so Normally, as what I do is I just put it in the auto tune, but because I was working on the 1490 for which the the loading order two works better, I forgot it and I just skipped it. So anyway, um, it should work better, like with better auto tuning. That's what I'm trying to, to say. Um, so this is the decoding phase with uh, GPT fast. So uh, decoding phase for uh, compared to uh, tiny GMM, which is like this GMV could recognize slightly worse. Uh, actually, like especially on A100, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's quite not reaching the, the performance I would like it to reach, but like 1419 and A100 uh, and H100 is working fine. But then, even like with the crappy auto tuning for the A100, you still like get much better performance, like for the batched. Um, Batch performance here. So this is good, looking good. And this is with group size 64. So if we don't use any group size, like channel wise, it should run much faster. Um, Llama. So oh, I'm just, this... I'm noticing we have uh, like three minutes left on the clock. Can we keep this recording going? Cause this talks so good, Byron? Yeah, yeah, sure. Or... No I'm just yeah, asking I'm Byron if, uh, if. Yeah, um... sure, sure. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is Llama 3. I actually forgot to put the 3 here. Um, yeah, Llama 3 is also a bit weird for a couple of reasons because Llama 3 has this 1024, 4096 shapes for which I didn't optimize the auto tuning. So um, this is the problems you have with Triton. Like you need to really think about all the shapes possible. So performance for Llama 3, this is why I put like work in progress. Like, you need to put like a bunch of auto tuning and experiment with all the shapes. It doesn't mean that your kernel is bad. It just means that you just need to run more auto tuning sometimes, right? So work in progress, but like even with that, it's actually pretty good. Um, it's like A100 is a bit concerning because of the TL load problem, but uh, it's very funny here is that the 1490 outperforming the H100 is super strange, but um, Fair enough, like for the H100, I need to do a TMA version, uh, which I have I have a draft of it, but it's not integrated uh, and I haven't tested it. But TMA would work fine for larger batch sizes as I, I explained, but we cannot use it for the weights. So we can only use it for the activations and the, the output. So I don't know if it's useless, but we need to try and see like what's going on because uh, the problem is that with TMA, we cannot load interleaved indices. Like you need to load the block pointer. Um, yeah, anyway, let's let's go ahead. Practical example, like if you want to try this, uh, you can try it with HQQ and um, uh, library. I'll just give you like an example, like very quickly. Uh, but the best way to do this with, is with Touch AO because we are trying to integrate this with Touch AO. Uh, but here, just to give you like uh, 
So this, um, so it's like 8x speed up with Llama 2 on the 1490, which is actually pretty good. This is actually pretty close to the tiny GMM performance. It's not, it's like there are a couple of tokens between them, which is totally fine. But uh, this is just to show you that you, with Triton, you can do like some, you can reach some good performance with this. Um, future work. First of all, I would say uh, big thanks to the PyTorch AO uh, and inductor teams. They were super helpful, especially like debugging this torch compiled weird, strange issues that I was facing. So they were super helpful. Um, so on the Triton Lang uh, site, like this, this tier load, like if you know someone from Triton Lang, please ping them to look into this because this is actually a blocker for many kernels. But basically, tier load is pretty slow on the A100. And I'm not hallucinating. I tried this on multiple instances, like Lambda Labs, Rust AI, different machines, different A100s, exactly the same problem. So it's not me just making stuff up. This is an actual problem. Um, so I opened an issue for this. Uh, this is for my Santa Claus wish list. So for each wish list, Santa Claus wish list, I put like the Santa Claus the emoji. So uh, fix the nightly build because the problem here is that I want to do a TMA version, but it's not available in the nightly build because the nightly build has been broken for three months and no one wants to fix it. So if someone knows someone from Triton team, please ping them to fix the nightly build because we want to build stuff with TMA, but we can't. Um, I mean, we can, but we need to wait like 40 minutes to compile every time. And every time you launch a new instance, like you need to compile. So so um, it's a bit annoying. I'm not sure if there's FP8, FP8 with 16 bit accumulation. I'm not sure um, if someone knows this, uh, but like if it's available, please add it because that would be super helpful. Uh, because what I noticed is that with um, when you're running these kernels like you you accumulate with fp16 it's like quite faster and there's like no difference in terms of quality so totally fine to do that uh we would like to extend this to lut based quantization methods because um right now i was talking about linear quantization but we want to use like lut based content so this is basically just changing the quantization step you would have like a lookup table my guess is that we will need to use eviction policy because we don't want to load the lookup table every time. Anyway, haven't tried it yet. Three bit, uh, five bit integration. I talked about it. I haven't tested it yet and it's not available in the master branch. And uh, partial TMA version, this is what I said. We can do TMA on like the activations and the output for the H100, but we cannot do it for the weights right now. And I am not sure if that would be helpful for very large uh, sizes. So we would need to see. Uh, what would be really cool is to have fuse kernels, like can maybe write the whole Triton kernel, like with the attention and everything, or at least have a fused MLP, like with, the, with like the two ML, uh, MLP layers in one single uh, Triton kernel. Uh, and maybe extend it to training. So we needed to do a transposed version for the GMM, which would be really cool. So you could maybe train two bit, four bit, whatever. And on the torch inductor side, so as I said, there's this early, there are some stuff that are not supported in Triton. So that would be good to have Santa Claus fix this and uh, add support for early config pruning and pre hooks. And a better CUDA graph support, because as I said, sometimes doing CUDA graphs yourself can outperform Torch compile like by a large margin. So there's definitely something going on that when you do reduce overhead, maybe it's not like detecting the right inputs, outputs to do it or something like this, but um, that would be, a, I will actually make everything faster if, if this is fixed. So now it's not a, like a blocker, but it's just a nice, nice, nice thing to have. Um, there's another issue, like this is my last issue. Auto tuning sometimes doesn't pick the, the best kernel. Up. So don't be uh, like, don't be um, surprised because the, the, the 
the auto tune uh, result that Triton picks, Python P, the best kernel to do end to end inference after torch compile. So um, you should not just rely on torch compile on auto tuning alone. You need also to play with it manually to see which ones because. I don't know why this happens, but you just need to be aware of this because like auto tuning, I don't know why that happens. So very tricky. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I, I We are like, I think it was exactly one hour 30 because we started at five. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm open for questions right now. Yeah, uh, the, the, the talk is amazing. Yeah, I have a few, few questions. So. Is the kernels already integrated into any like serving framework like VLM or SGLAN? And what's the status to be uh, integrated into Torchlight IO? Do you have a timeline? Uh, I mean, it's right now being integrated with Torch IO. Uh, as I said, oh. this is work in progress. There's like still some stuff to figure out. This A100 headache problem I'm trying to figure out. Um, but I mean, I mean, at least. We, we have like, it should not be too difficult. Like right now what we are doing with Torch.io is uh, we are doing a uh, benchmark with GPT fast to see if like the whole thing works fine. And like, it's already there. Like Charles from AO team is working on this. And uh, so like, we just need to port the kernels there. But uh, yeah, uh, I mean, AO side, we are working on it. VDNM and SGDank maybe after AO. So they can maybe just That's cool. maybe they can and just by integration, do you mean like just moving the code there or depend on this library? Yeah, I mean I think the best is to move the kernel so you don't have an extra dependency because right now the project has also the CUDA kernels and it needs to build also the CUDA kernels, but you don't need oh, the CUDA kernels. You don't need the CUDA kernels to run the Triton kernels. So I'm thinking about actually moving the CUDA kernels outside to another uh, GitHub repo, so you don't have to uh, build them every time. Because every time you do pip install, blah, 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 it starts to build, so a bit annoying. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I can do that, just move the CUDA kernels to another project. So, But uh, ideally, like move the, the kernels. I mean, it's, the problem is that it's a bit complicated because you have all this logic of meta auto tuning which is like not just auto tuning each kernel but you also need to pick which kernel uh, which triton works for which shapes because i have right now two versions of a g and v and i did a third one because each one works dif differently on on uh, different uh, devices for some reason and I cannot predict which one will work better on the other one. All I can do is to come up with different algorithms that I can implement and just test them. So right now there are two versions of a GMV, one split K and one GMM. I'm gonna add a third GMV. So it's gonna be five kernels, but so like for some shapes we need to run actually, let's say GM, like bat size one, we need to run the three GMVs and figure out like which one works the best. But as I said, like we can catch this. So because this is not Triton auto tuning, this is like some external auto tuning that I added, and it just puts like this stuff in a in a dictionary that just with strings, so you can just save it with NumPy or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's not just what I want to say. It's not just copying the kernels. There's like a, a whole logic around them, like to to basically figure out the best kernel, et cetera. But, uh, but it's basically one file and each kernel is in a separate file. So so it's- uh, I see, I see. That yeah. makes sense. So I think we can answer questions until 45. Maybe we can take a, pick a few. Yeah, sure. Um, I believe uh, we have to change the title of this presentation to Triton Performance Tuning. Uh, Brian, you yeah, are yeah. Nailed, nailed it. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this was one of the fantastic presentations in a while that I've seen where uh, so many uh, gotchas or experience-based material being covered. Uh, I was always thinking, hey, Triton is magic, but uh, in reality, it is not. Uh, and you are oh, uncovering, not. yeah, you're uncovering a lot of like nuances that really matter. 
So, which is very nice. Uh, I think uh, best practice guides for Triton uh, in itself is very important. And uh, 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 I believe there's a lot of work to be done here, so. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think Triton can reach some very good performance if it's done properly, but I think also there are a lot of features missing. Uh, so I'm curious about, uh, uh, we are speaking of uh, how this numbers looks so good uh, from uh, Torch.io standpoint of view or the uh, SGLang and VLLM. What are your, I'm going to be selfish, what are your thoughts on enabling it on TRTLLM side of things? Uh, what's that? Uh, the NVIDIA's TRTLLM. Do you uh, plan to have any integration plans with them or no? Or you have no idea who, uh, whom to talk to in the TRTLLM? I, 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 I don't even know the project. <laughs> okay, but, uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but if it's NVIDIA, it's going to be CUDA and Cutlass, and this is just Triton. Yeah, that's or, fine. Oh, that's fine. Okay. I, I mean, it's an open source project. Anyone can just yeah. like go there. But like, if you need help with integration, if you're interested, um, I, I mean, I, I'm happy happy to help. But as I said, this is still work in progress. I just started this like two months ago. Like two months ago, I didn't even know like what is eviction policy. So I, I'm still like just learning and just discovering because. Before I was doing CUDA to a certain limited extent just for small stuff, but I was I always thought like it's exactly what you said in the beginning. Like I said, like oh, Triton is this magic thing. You just write something it works, and I thought, oh, it's maybe I should give it a try, and I was very disappointed to the point that when I wrote the first, I, I don't Triton like two days, just like like how to add. Like I was just following the tutorial. And then I, I wrote the kernel and I was like super disappointed to the point that I ditched Triton and got back to CUDA. And then just randomly, I had this idea, maybe I should play with Triton more. And then I started to give it like more time because like, if you just do it, like you need to be a little bit patient because if you just do it naively, like I said, without all these tricks, it's just, it's just like performance pretty disappointing. So uh, if you if you just go to the, the links I have shared, they have the GitHub page, uh, like it's open source, they have the kernels, you can try it yourself and you would see. Um, I mean, you just get like half the performance of a CUDA kernel. So, um, but I'm not saying everything could work with this. Uh, I'm just saying that like some stuff could work and I'm still trying to understand how this thing can be improved because this loading order doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, stuff like just breaking because uh, I'll give you like a very simple example. Like I spent like three days running uh, on some machine. On the, I had a kernel that was working on 1490, was not working on the A100. In the for loop, it was just crashing for no apparent reason. And I just like just randomly had this thought. It was like 4K in range something i just do it was like 4k in range num pidk i just do i just added the line if k is smaller than num pidk and it starts to work i mean it's just like it doesn't make any sense like why is this like crashing and like there are people complaining about the exact same problem and like there, there, there were like two issues about this thing oh it's crashing when you have unpacked data and you want to um when you have packed data and you want to unpack in the for loop and there's this strange stuff that you spend your time on it. Like you're not focusing on the algorithm, right? Because um, there are diff different ways you can improve the algorithm itself. Because like, for example, you can avoid loading the scales uh, many times if the group size is, uh, has a certain value. So you're, you could focus on the algorithm to make things faster, but you spend your time focusing on this stupid, small, weird stuff that actually have a big impact on performance. So uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's, this is supposed to be working like this because I was supposed to the compiler would take care of this, but it just doesn't. And uh, yeah, this is what it is like this. Interesting. Uh, there's a lot of concerns around uh, uh, Triton stability uh, in that statement that you made. Yeah, I, I mean, some stuff work fine, but like, as I said, like some situations you start to do something more complicated and you run, run into many, uh, many issues. Uh, one, one thing that is uh, a bit annoying is um, the storage compile stuff. 
So uh, because like to write a proper Triton kernel, like you need to prune these configs to make sure that configs are not, are comp will give like the right uh, results. But right now, many things are not supported by Torch Compile. So we are losing a lot of on performance for that specific, because of that specific issue. So uh, I'm just saying that the results that I showed, they, are, they look good, they are promising, but this is not like the best we can get because there are a lot of issues we need to fix. Uh, in order to get good performance across different devices. Right now, ADA GPUs are working very good. Uh, 1390 working quite good. Uh, even the 2080 is working quite good for some reason. Uh, 2080 Ti and Titan RT uh, RTX, which is like very old, still working. But A100, H100, they need some babysitting. They need like a little bit more work to figure out like what's going on there. Maybe it needs a different algorithm. Uh, let's see. A question I have is like, so it sounds like you're saying you spent a lot of time both with CUDA and Triton in this. Would you say maybe instead of like learning CUDA, then Triton and just sort of learning both, like kind of at the same time, like, or what do you think about that? Yeah, maybe it's fine. I mean, I mean, what I'm, when I say learning CUDA, it's just like, you need to just be able to write at least like vector addition or something. Like this. Just need to know what is what are threads. Actually, it's if you know what is a warp, that will be up. and how warps work because they would help you just understand a little bit like how data is, can be loaded faster and stuff like this. But like you don't need like really advanced stuff. Uh, I mean, myself, I cannot write a very fast GMM in CUDA. Like like you need like a lot of stuff to write stuff in CUDA, pure CUDA for, for like a GM. I can write a GMV, which works very good, but I cannot write a GMM. So like even my, my, my CUDA knowledge is not super advanced, but when I say learn CUDA first, like it's just say like, you just need to have basic understanding how things work, like how threads work. And Triton is basically, instead of working on, with, thread, uh, with like individual threads, you just work with blocks. So think about it as, parallel programming and you just did it like how to break things into blocks and that's it it's uh, quite like you can literally learn learn it in one two days it's not super super difficult because in triton like you, you have a very limited set of functions they fit in actually one page it's not like a ptx doc that is huge right right so it's not like a lot of things that you need to remember it's like very basic stuff. Okay, I want to load data TL load. I want to store data TL store. I want to do dot product TL dot uh, TL dot dot. You know, like it's not like you need to remember many functions, which is which is good. But uh, learning Triton is not a problem. It's like making the Triton work is the problem. <laughs> like yeah, making it work fast. That's that's the problem. And then another question I have is, wait, so uh, can you use like the Hopper's new features with Triton or not? I, I think I heard like two different things, maybe. So you can if you build it yourself. It's okay. not in the, it's not like in the nightly or official build. Uh, and the build has been blocked, broken for three months. So that feature is not available if you just do pp install or PP style lightly, like you need to clone it and build it yourself, which takes like 30 minutes. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it works pretty good. I implemented the a GMM with the TMA from Triton. It works as expected. It's like same performance as reference. So yeah. But so if it works for you, you could probably expect it to be officially released reasonably soon, right? Yeah, I, I think someone uh, on the Discord channel, they mentioned that uh, someone from the inductor team is looking into this because many people are complaining about the build broken for three months. Um, but I mean, they just need to fix like the wheel build, which is, I would suppose that it's simple. <laughs> Maybe some test is breaking or something like this, but uh, but yeah, to answer you, if you clone it yourself and build it yourself, you can. And it works. Uh, I just did it. Yeah. It's, and it's actually very simple to use TNA. Uh, 
So before that, the previous version TMB was extremely slow, but then they did some magic to make the descriptors uh, initialized very fast. So it's it's working well. Awesome. So I think we can close this out now. Um, everyone still here. Thanks so much. Give a great round of applause. This is an awesome talk. I learned a ton. I'll probably be rewatching this myself. Um, so if there's anything you want to plug, um, like, I don't know, these repos, I think these links are in the chat. I guess the best places to go would be where? I mean, I guess we'll have them in the CUDA mode resources. We'll have slides and stuff in this YouTube video yeah. description. Um, anything else yeah. I'm missing? Yeah, I mean, perfect. Uh, if you have any any question, just ping me on Discord. Um, Moby Sham, so any question, happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh